One of the um, challenges and privileges of preaching verse by verse through Scripture is you get to these passages and uh, these, these longer chunks of Scripture where you have very difficult statements and difficult doctrines that you can't skip over. Uh, it's one of the privileges of this. It's also one of the challenges. So uh, we want to, um, I, and it's one of the reasons I want to just reiterate that I love the Bible is that uh, it doesn't gloss over really difficult details. It doesn't gloss over really tricky things, and it tells exactly how things are. And uh, our passage today, we're in Exodus chapter 7. If you have your copy of God's Word, go ahead and open up there. It's pretty simple to get there. It's the second book in your Bible. The big numbers are the chapters and little numbers are your verses. This is a double whammy passage of hard moments in scripture, okay? Because the first is an active statement from the Lord God Yahweh, where he says, I will harden Pharaoh's heart. So that's hard statement number one. Hard statement number two is that Pharaoh's magicians are able to replicate the sign that God has given to Moses to demonstrate Moses' authority. So double whammies. And um, so uh, what, what we're going to do today to, to make sense of things is I'm going to maximize our time when we talk about magicians. And we are going to cover the hardening of hearts in our passage today, but in great detail in Exodus chapter 9, where there's an expanded uh, description from the Lord on what he's doing. In fact, he goes into the detail, say, for this very purpose, I've raised you up, Pharaoh, Exodus chapter nine, for this very purpose. So uh, when we get to that, uh, I know I just said it's a privilege and I said, you don't get to skip and uh, I'm not skipping, I'm just delaying, okay? Uh, that's the difference, that's a joke, but it might not have landed. Um, my microphone wasn't working either. She didn't hear my Travis Kelsey and Taylor Swift joke either, but that's fine. Um, today, uh, I want for us to see that just like God shows us his power over Egypt's symbols, God's power is ultimately manifest in Christ's conquering of death. So today we're going to see God do miraculous things where he destroys, subverts, and inverts Egypt's own symbols to demonstrate his power, but I'm going to take us to the New Testament to see ultimately how Christ does this in swallowing death up into himself. So it's, that's what we're going to see today. But if you have your copy of God's Word again, let me, let me get it in front of us and read. I'm going to be reading Exodus 7, 1 through 13. And uh, so I'll get started. And the Lord said to Moses, See, I have made you like God to Pharaoh, and your brother Aaron shall be your prophet. You shall speak all that I command you, and your brother Aaron shall tell Pharaoh to let the people of Israel go out of his land. But I will harden Pharaoh's heart. That's that active voice. I will harden Pharaoh's heart. And th uh, though I multiply my signs and wonders in the land of Egypt, Pharaoh will not listen to you. Then I will lay my hand on Egypt and bring my hosts, my people, the children of Israel, out of the land of Egypt by great acts of judgment. The Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord when I stretch out my hand against Egypt and bring out the people of Israel from among them. Moses and Aaron did so. They did just as the Lord commanded them. Now Moses was 80 years old and Aaron 83 years old when they spoke to Pharaoh. Then the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, when Pharaoh says to you, prove yourself by working a miracle, then you shall say to Aaron, take your staff, cast it down before Pharaoh that it may become a serpent. So Moses and Aaron went to Pharaoh and did just as the Lord commanded. Aaron cast down his staff before Pharaoh and his servants, and it became a serpent. Then Pharaoh summoned the wise men and the sorcerers, and they, the magicians of Egypt, did the same by their secret arts. For each man cast down his staff, and they became serpents. But Aaron's staff swallowed up their staffs. Still, Pharaoh's heart was hardened. And he would not listen to them as the Lord said. So this is an important turning point that we're entering into in, Egypt, uh, in, in Exodus. So the first parts of Exodus have been focusing primarily on Moses and Aaron and their qualifications by God. There's been a lot of scene setting with who is this Pharaoh? How has God prepared Moses and Aaron to go to this Pharaoh? And now we're entering a, a, a new chapter, so to speak, a new pivot point starting in chapter 7, that's going to last all the way to chapter 15. It's this unit where we typically think of as the 10 plagues, and uh, it's, it's the period of the Exodus. 
But, uh, and, and, and as we think about, the reason we think about it this way is uh, it opens with a foreshadowing which ultimately finds its uh, fulfillment in Exodus 15. So in Exodus 7, Aaron's staff swallows up uh, Pharaoh's staff. And then at the very end, the culmination, it grows until we see most plainly what the Lord is doing here when the sea swallows up Israel's army. So when commentators talk about this, they, they bracket it off Exodus 7, Exodus 15. So thematically, we're in a new passage of Scripture. We're in a new, a new chapter, so to speak, of Scripture where things, in my opinion, get a little bit, they get a little bit darker. They get even heavier, which is hard to believe because up to this point, we've had babies thrown into water. We've had babies murdered. We've had, uh, we've had all sorts of things happening. Uh, we've had oppression on top of oppression. We've had all sorts of things. And, and I think things get darker. So let me just remind you, from Exodus 4 to 6, this is, this is the scene that we've set up. Moses is discouraged. So in Exodus chapter 4 through 6, Moses is not going into this moment filled with bravado, filled with, I've got this. In fact, he has, by worldly sense, failed multiple times, actually. Um, but we've, we've seen uh, also last week that God's plan for Moses. He's been preparing Moses to do this work for a very long time. We saw his genealogy and Aaron's genealogy. Moses was quite literally born to do this work. And so he has, he has shown himself God working a long plan of redemption. We're going to see that again in our passage today. And then we've seen again and again from Exodus 4 to Exodus 6, all those chapters, God emphasizes over and over and over again his sovereignty. The fact that Pharaoh believes that he is a God, a lowercase g God, is irrelevant to the Lord God Almighty. That's an irrelevant fact to Lord God Almighty. So when we enter this passage, the first thing that we're going to see is how God's power sends his servants. So the first thing we'll see is God's power sends his servants. I'll remind you what we talked about last week. We talked about how Moses felt like he was inadequate to, to do the task that God had given him. We talked about genealogy, that he was literally born for this. And then it ends with Moses repeating, I'm still probably not your guy, right? The last verse of chapter six is, I have uncircumcised lips. And God is not unconcerned, but he is, uh, that is an irrelevant fact to him. Uh, last week, we talked about how God leverages our weaknesses in order to maximize his glory. And again, here we see that Moses has been appointed to this task. Moses is the appointed representative, which shows God's sovereign choice to pick Moses, in spite of his weaknesses, to do this very task. Uh, last week, I had to stop. We, we were going too long, and I had said there were four imperatives in this passage. The first was go and tell, right? Where we will not ever evangelize anybody unless we go to them. So Moses is sent to these people. And then he said to tell them about what I'm going to do. And the same for us. We're, we're, never going to, we're never going to be effective evangelists if we never open our mouths, right? Uh, but there were two more imperatives that I, that I missed that are relevant here as well. C, look with me in verse 1. This is a curious, curious statement. God says, See, I have made you like God to Pharaoh. Moses tells, is told by God to see something within himself. And there's no question here, Moses is going to be imbued with tremendous power. He is quite literally, the text says, like God. And in my study, I thought to myself, that's a, that's a bizarre phrase, because in other places of Scripture, like God is not something that we want to seek after. What's the what's this thing that the serpent says to Adam and Eve? He knows if you'll eat of it, you'll become what? Like God. So when I read it, when I was studying, I was like, that's an odd statement. And so I do what any normal person does. And I went to the Septuagint. And I was like, what does the Septuagint say? And uh, it doesn't soften the meaning at all, actually. It's quite literally, uh, God has made him God. Uh, that's, it, it, there's no like in the Septuagint. I have made you God is what the Greek of the Septuagint says. And again, that's a striking statement when you put it in relief with Genesis 3.5 where the serpent says, God knows that when you eat, your eyes will be open and you will be like God. Now, details matter here, and I think they matter in Genesis and they matter in Exodus. And the problem with Satan's 
invitation to uh, the man and woman in the garden is that Satan is promising a simulation of deity. It's very similar actually to how Pharaoh thinks about himself, that he is like a god, showing himself to be in a very real sense a child, right? One of the offspring of the serpent, right? And uh, he has no power to give, as we're going to see in just a few moments. Satan actually has no power to really give to anybody. He can't make people powerful in and of himself. So the emphasis here is totally on God's sovereign appointment. Moses, in spite of his uncircumcised lips, has been made like God as his representative. He's been given this power, this authority, which reminds me a lot of ways of the Great Commission where it says of us that all authority has been given to me and I now give to you, go then and make disciples and I'll be with you until the end of the age. So we think about evangelism. What, what would it change about you when you think about going to people who are certainly not gonna listen to you if you knew that all authority had been given to my Lord and my Lord has sent me with his authority and his spirit within me? The question is, would that change the way that you think about going to our own pharaohic culture. Moses has pointed this out over and over again, his inadequacies, and God is totally unconcerned because Moses has been appointed to this task. Because Moses' job is not to make Pharaoh pay attention to him. He's ultimately going to be God's work to, to uh, reveal himself to Pharaoh. God, you see, is keen to show Egypt and Israel that Pharaoh is no God, by taking a timid ex-shepherd and making him more powerful than Pharaoh. You see that? That's the whole point here, that the most powerful nation in the ancient world is going to be humiliated by an ex-shepherd from Midian. Then despite all of this, though, Pharaoh, as we see and, and we'll see in our text, the Lord, Lord says over and over again here, uh, that, that the people, uh, he's going to do these signs, these wonders, and Pharaoh will not, he will not be moved, he will not be, he will not give up his self-delusions of autocratic de despotism. He will not fear the Lord. He will continue to resist. The second imperative that Moses given is to speak, right? Look at verse 2, right? And, and I've added another one in my study. So I originally said there were four, but plot twist, there were five, okay? So speak, the command to speak God's word. How is Moses going to know that he's a faithful prophet? You see, your brother Moses, verse one, shall be a prophet. How do we know, and we've already talked about this in, in Exodus four, that someone's a faithful servant, a faithful representative, a faithful prophet, if they do really miraculous things? No, if they speak the word of God. So verse two, you shall speak all that I've commanded, not some, not whatever you want to share with Pharaoh, but all that I have commanded to you. God's directive to Moses and Aaron is to confront Pharaoh. And it, it emphasizes the power of God's word to challenge our current and, and any earthly authorities. I hope you believe that too. When, when Jesus tells us that, that we will be summoned, uh, we'll be pulled out of synagogues, we'll be asked to give accounts. There's many different types of things. There's Luke, I'm thinking about First Peter, um, our faithfulness is not, again, whether somebody believes, repents and believes. Our faithfulness is, did we communicate all that the Lord has said? Did we communicate all that the Lord has said? And then finally, verse 9, God tells Moses, this appointed person sent, that he's going to take. He's going to take his staff and demonstrate power. He's going to demonstrate power. We'll see that in just a sec. I'm going to show you in a second how that subverts symbols. But we think about what it means uh, that you are sent, don't neglect the power of your own testimony. Um, because again, if you think about you being sent as well, um, the Lord has done a miracle in all of our lives. If we confess the gospel, it's that we were dead and now we are alive. And the truth is, is that your testimony is more powerful in meaningful ways than a staff turning to a serpent, you picking it back up and it becoming a staff because you're a dead person now alive. And if you don't believe that, you think about when Jesus is teaching about the rich man and Lazarus, and the rich man is in, is in uh, Gehenna, and he's asking, uh, please, let somebody come back and tell my brothers. And what does Father Abraham say? He says, 
They have the word of God. If they don't believe that, it doesn't matter if somebody comes back from the dead. The power of our individual testimonies of us living a life reconciled to God, a holy life before God, is a meaningful and very genuine, uh, it's a very genuine sign. So remember that you are a resurrected life and a living sign of God's resurrecting power. The things you once loved, you no longer love. You make war against it. You don't want to be that, so maybe you fall into it occasionally, but it's not something you love anymore. Instead, you love entirely different things. You love people you used to not love. You love serving in ways you used to not love serving. You don't need to show any more than your transformed heart. Back to our text, we're at, again, this inflection point, like I talked about in the book of Exodus, which is going to reverberate throughout Scripture. It's, it's genuine. There's, there's, all of Scripture is really profitable. All of it is meaningful. But it is really hard to under, uh, it's really hard to overemphasize how pivotal this, these next few chapters are for all of Scripture. So the paradigms which are, which are coming um, are, are, are much, uh, they play throughout the New Testament. Um, and if we, if we look at them, if we look at this 7 through 15 with eyes of faith, I'm, pr- I'm praying personally for us that we'll see our, our drowning and dying neighbors and have compassion on them and go to them. That as we study this passage, we'll be more inflamed to be a people on mission for the sake of our city. When you study, when you study World War I, you typically think about four major inputs into the war, and people learn them as different isms or stuff, but you could think of them, for instance, as the Congress of Vienna, which carves up, uh, carves up Europe into, into different nation states. It's how you get the Balkans the way that you get them, this mixing pot that's ready to explode. You could also think about the instability of the Balkans as the Ottoman Empire pulls out. So you leave this power vacuum, and this place has been divided up in the Congress of Vienna, but then you also think about, you think about Prussian expansions, the German nation, gets a sense of itself, it, it expands, it wants to become bigger, and then you have entents everywhere. Everybody's making all these alliances, and everything seems set. Nothing's ever inevitable in history, but in one, se- uh, in one sense, the stage for World War I is set decades in advance. And uh, again, nothing's inevitable, but all it took was, was one domino falling, and then things cascaded. You pull a rubber band back and it's going to snap. Um, when the Archduke Ferdinand is, is assassinated, there's no way to stop to put this back. And the scenes for what we're about to see have been set generations prior to this. Think about you know, World War I, it's 100 years. But what we're seeing now this, in this pivot, this was set hundreds of years before. Let me remind you, for instance, of what God tells Abraham in Genesis 15, Genesis 15, 13 to 16 says, then the Lord said to Abraham, know for certain that your offspring will be sojourners in a land that's not theirs and will be servants there. Talking about Egypt. And they will be afflicted for 400 years. We've heard the word afflicted before, haven't we? But I will bring judgment on the nation that they serve and afterwards they shall come out with great possession. And as for you, you shall go to your fathers in peace. You should be buried in a good old age. And they will come back here in the fourth generation, for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet complete. Egypt, in one sense, could have cried out at any moment to reverse their fortunes. But in another real sense, as God were, God's word is going to make clearer in Exodus chapter 9, God raised this Pharaoh up to demonstrate his power. And Paul, in Romans 9, picks up on Exodus 9 and makes a big deal about this Pharaoh being chosen for this task. But the argument is from the the lesser, uh, the greater to the lesser. If God can take an enslaved people and lead them out in a military procession, if he can take them out of Egypt and all the suffering, this great military and economic powerhouse, then surely he could take the Israelites and bring them into the promised land. If he could take them out of Egypt, this place where surely they could have never made it out, absolutely he could then have them settle the Canaanite the promised land. Of course, that's a, that's a question that as they get closer and closer to the promised land, is the Lord going to allow us to inhabit this land? Their faith falters right, at multiple points. But to show that God was powerful to do this in Exodus, he has done four things. 
he has set up a reluctant Moses. The guy who's going to do it doesn't think he's up to the task. That's so important because the faith of the Israelites wouldn't be based in Moses. You have an unconvinced Pharaoh. There's these miraculous things happening in front of him, and Pharaoh is unconvinced of Yahweh's power. You have a broken and beaten people. These people aren't going to be marching out in pride. We just heard in the prior chapter, verse 9, they were broken in spirit. They were broken in spirit. And then God is going to take this non-people. Because at this moment, they're not really a nation. They're just a non-people. They're just people that live in Goshen whose dad is Jacob. And he's going to make these people into a great nation. A great nation. And Moses is God's sovereign appointed representative to do the task. Second, we're going to see God's sovereignty over the human heart. The hardening of Pharaoh's heart by God demonstrates his control over the human hearts and destinies and underscores the seriousness of rebellion against him. And again, I'm going to talk about the active hardening of Pharaoh's heart when we get to chapter 9, because again, that's where it says that God hardens Pharaoh's heart. And throughout the passages that we'll see, we'll see it seems like it goes back and forth, that Pharaoh's heart is hardened, or that Pharaoh, like Pharaoh hardens his own heart, or that God hardens his heart. But quickly, I just want to point out that in this passage right here, the text says God is actively hardening Pharaoh's heart. We'll talk about how and why again in Exodus chapter 9. And that God is going to be justified in second, piling up signs and wonders. It's interesting in verse 3 where it says to multiply. Uh, the Hebrew there is the same as it says, you know, be fruitful and multiply, right? It's this idea of piling up. So God is going to heap judgment on Egypt. He's going to heap judgment on Egypt, and it's still not moving Pharaoh's heart, which shows God's justice in, in continuing to heap up more. And, and that's where we're going to go deep there. But again, I want to emphasize here how God shows his power over Egypt's God, and he does so ultimately triumphing over sin and death in Christ. But, but what are the purposes of God's judgment? That's the question asked right here. Because in verse 3 and 4, we see that God is laying down judgment. We see at the end of verse 4, I will bring them out by great acts of judgment. God's judgments manifested through the hardening of hearts and the signs he's going to multiply serve to reveal his glory and show who he is and his justice. So he's going to use signs and wonders to demonstrate his power against evil. Verse 5 through 13, this is where we're going to move for our third point. I'm going to focus in a lot here because some of the other things we can pick up. But read with me again, verses 5 through 13, to get the scene back in front of us. The Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord when I stretch out my hand against Egypt and bring the people of Israel from them. Moses and Aaron did so. They did just as the Lord commanded them. Moses was 80 years old and Aaron was 83 years old when they spoke to Pharaoh. Then the Lord said to Moses, when Pharaoh says to you, prove yourself by working a miracle... Then you shall say to Aaron, take your staff, cast it down before Pharaoh, that it may become a serpent. So Moses and Aaron went to Pharaoh and did just as the Lord commanded. Aaron cast down his staff before Pharaoh and his servants and became a serpent. Then Pharaoh summoned his wise men, the sorcerers, and they, the Egyptians of Egypt, also did the same by their secret arts. For each man cast down his staff and they became serpents. But Aaron's staff swallowed up their staffs. And still Pharaoh's heart was hardened and he would not listen to them as the Lord had said. So again, I want to focus on the staffs because again, this is opening up a new chapter within Exodus, which functions as a polemic against Egypt. So one of the things that the Lord is going to do over these next passages is show the Israelite people the deficiencies of the Egyptian religion in order that they be all the more confirmed in their belief in God's goodness. So it's not about the people of Egypt that he's making war against. He's doing a polemic against the Egyptian pantheon. Now, a polemic is a critical attack. We're familiar with apologetics, which is a defense of the faith. Well, a polemic is an attack against something else. So, uh, so some people um, have polemics against Christianity, and we might have polemics against, say, Islam. And, uh, and uh, a practicing Muslim would have apologetics against the polemic. Does that make sense? This whole passage, the way this is structured is, it's a polemic for the people of Israel against the pantheon of Egypt. And if we pause for a moment and think about how the people of God received this text, it was received after the Exodus, we get a sense for how 
God through uh, Moses was helping the people deprogram Egyptian theology and help them understand what it means to live as the people of God. So the symbols here in this passage matter significantly, and unless somebody can help you see them, it can get a little weird, okay? Because it is, it's a little strange thing about sticks turning into snakes. Why in the world is that happening, okay? Um, they matter incredibly, and because our, our symbols of authority don't map the same as they did in ancient Egypt. So when, let's talk about Aaron's rod becoming a staff. Uh, the transformation of Aaron's rod turning into a serpent signifies God's supreme power, his unmatched power over the natural and supernatural realms, and it challenges the false gods of Egypt. So symbols of serpents, cobras, vipers, other species held tremendous power and tremendous authority and influence in Egypt. And it makes sense because on the one hand, snakes are very terrifying. They still scare us today because the bite from the wrong snake can kill you if you don't get antivenom, right? But on the other hand, the person who's able to control the snakes, who seems to have authority over snakes, is somebody who's given great leeway. So, oh, wow, you have amazing powers, okay? Until about 150 years ago, right, before we really understood zoology, people just avoided snakes, and snakes were really scary, and it was really odd. Now we understand them a little bit better, so they're not quite as spooky, but we still tend to avoid them, and nobody really likes a surprise snake, right? We don't tend to like those. In Egypt, they're, they're even more, they're even more uh, scary because there's no antivenom, and anybody who can seemingly control them appears even more godlike. So much so, than the lower Nile where this is happening, the symbol goddess, Wajet, of the lower Egyptian delta is, guess, a cobra, Okay. So Pharaoh, he is believed by the Egyptians to be in, in, uh, imbued by the power of a cobra. So his authority and his power is, uh, is snake-like. And the biblical authors are very aware of this. So listen, for example, how Ezekiel, even hundreds of years after the Exodus, talks about Egypt and still their infatuation with snake images. Ezekiel 29.3 says, Speak and say, Thus says the Lord God, Behold, I am against you, Pharaoh, king of Egypt, the great dragon that lies in the midst of his streams that says, my Nile is my own, I made it for myself. Now, the word dragon that the ESV translates there is, a, is an odd one, but it's, it, and it reflects the Septuagint in the way that it translates the Hebrew, but all there, underneath there, is the word snake. The reason that the Greek is translated dragon is because this is a particularly terrifying serpent, dragon. And, and of course, then John and his revelation looks back and says that great dragon, right? Uh, that's the link. That's where all that language comes from. So this is serpent language here. So don't get tripped by dragons. We're not, this isn't Harry Potter or something or, or Lord of the Rings. We we're talking about snakes here. Even Ezekiel's aware of how the Pharaoh wants to see himself stylized as the great serpent. You see that? And if you're thinking about the garden, there's, of course, linguistic connections to the garden as well, because what's present in the garden? A snake, right? And, and if you look forward to the New Testament, what does John the Baptist call people who oppose the coming of the kingdom of God? A brood of what? Vipers, right? So you see the serpent language is very critical throughout Scripture. And so why does God use a serpent? Why not use something else? Well, the ancient Egyptian texts tell us that their court theology, the, the way that the Egyptians believed, there was a certain pride that their magicians had in their ability to manipulate snakes. So whoever could control the snakes controlled the aura of the court. And uh, so their snake charming reinforced this aura of Pharaoh. Uh, there's a New Testament or an Old Testament professor at um, RTS Jackson. His name is John Currid. He's got a really great, if you're curious about polemics and how the Old Testament is a polemic, a really great book, maybe about 120 pages, published by Crossway, called Against the Gods. It's a very popular, accessible book on some of these themes. He has a journal article in a Swiss journal, and he points out that most Egyptian religious texts, the ones that were like their versions of Bibles, anticipated a mythological hero who could perform wonders with the staff. And get this, 
by transforming a staff into an animal, okay? So why does God use a serpent? John Currid, among others, really bright uh, Old Testament uh, scholar, um, God has Moses throw a symbol down on the ground to show that Pharaoh's power in front of Pharaoh is powerless. And it's a great irony because the Egyptian religious texts anticipate a figure who's able to do what with his staff, right? To turn it into an animal and then do what? Pick it back up again. And so God is humiliating the pantheon of Egypt because by allowing Moses and Aaron to control the very symbol of Pharaoh's power, he's doing things that the Egyptian religion only ever dreamed about. They could never simulate it. God is showing complete and total sovereignty over the situation here. But what about the magician's imitation? Because that's a great question. The Egyptians' magicians, uh, the Egyptian magicians, that's a, that's a word, uh, their ability to replicate Aaron's sign, that was a, that was a struggle to study. I think um, I, was telling, um, I was telling Julian and Susan, I read probably 12 commentaries to try to, I mean, in dictionaries and journal articles, which is how I found the Curate article, to try to figure out what is the secret art. Uh, it's one of these phrases in Hebrew that occurs extremely rarely. And, um, and so there's, there's, there's a lot of questions about what is the secret art that they're doing. So let's make one thing clear right off the bat. Whatever it is that the Egyptian magicians are doing, it's not total because what serpent ends up swallowing up their trick, so to speak? So even in, the, even in the, the situation that's happening, God is still showing sovereignty because the serpent of Aaron and Moses, Aaron's staff, swallows up the magician's staffs. Uh, Jewish rabbis taught about this passage that it was a sleight of hand, that perhaps they had paralyzed a snake, and when it was thrown on the ground, it startled the snake so it could slither, Right? Maybe, but the term magician here has particularly dark undertones. So the Bible, the Bible has, a, has a lot to say about this idea of magic. And when I talk about magic here, I'm not talking about like illusions or sleight of hand or card tricks. Uh, the Bible has, a, has an ambivalent stance towards wisdom, acknowledging that it has a potential for good, but also a great capacity for evil and wickedness. So while it's often shown to be wise, um, as in the case of the wise men who visit Jesus, but these are good wise men. They don't have special revelations. They don't know the Lord, but they, they know enough to come and find the Lord. That's wise. Several times, however, there's wisdom that leads to dark outcomes, emphasizing without the fear of the Lord, wisdom can actually be destructive. Think, for example, about the clever serpent in the garden or the terrible advice given throughout Kings over and over again. So in the Bible, the authors explain sorcery. Uh, it's, it's an aim to alter the future through black magic, right? Uh, and it's considered more demonic and unacceptable compared to other things. Um, there's other things uh, that go on in scripture where there's tons of condemnation for any practitioners. Think about Queen Jezebel and how she has her own or King Manasseh and how he does secret things. So while the Bible doesn't say specifically what the secret acts that these Egyptian magicians are doing right here, to me it seems it's darker than sleight of hand. There isn't a trick here happening. There's, there's a wickedness at play, and I think it's subsumed under the fact that they have the very symbol of the serpent. Now, that's just me reading the text, because um, I think that our naturalistic worldview has hardened our hearts the idea that there really is and there really are real powers that operate and are opposed to us. Um, and they manifest themselves probably in our culture in more clever and, uh, and concealed ways, but are nonetheless just as dark. Um, John Calvin has a great quote on this passage. He says, it should not be wondered if God plunges into the deepest darkness of, if God plunges into the deepest darkness of errors, those who shut their eyes against the light he brings to them, that if he hands them over to be the disciples of Satan that they already are, who refuse to listen to him as their master. In my view, it shouldn't be surprising to us that as Western civilization increasingly rejects Christianity, that we 
are also not seeing a rise in neo-paganism of Norse paganism and Celtic paganism in a very real way, right? Um, these secret arts, whatever they are, they're, they're, they're wicked and they're evil. But ultimately, they're, they're powerless. The Lord crushes them. And ultimately, I'd want for you to see that the, the greatest power, our greatest enemy, death, is destroyed ultimately in God's swallowing up of death in and of himself. So my final point as we get near our close, just as God demonstrates his power over Egypt, Egypt's gods, uh, he does so in Christ. The Pharaoh had power because he gave the illusion of the power of death by controlling this image of serpent and uh, by controlling imaginations. But, but God has real power by what he does in his death on the cross. With those images of, of, of the staffs swallowing up, hear how the Old Testament talks about the work of the Messiah. This one was a genuine surprise to me. I'm always surprised when I study the text. I'm like, wow. Isaiah 25, 8. He will swallow up death forever. And the Lord God will wipe away tears from all their faces and the reproach of his people. He will take away from all the earth for the Lord has spoken. There's that verb. That's not a verb that actually occurs very often in scripture. This idea of swallowing up death. It's a rare-ish verb. But then how does the New Testament talk about Christ's work? 1 Corinthians chapter 15. When the perishable puts on the imperishable and the mortal puts on immortality, then shall come to pass the saying that is written, death is what? Swallowed up into victory. Hebrews 2, 14 through 15. Since therefore the children share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise partook of the same things that through death he might destroy the one who is power of death that is, the devil, and deliver all those who fear death were subject to uh, lifelong slavery, right? He took on death that he would destroy it by taking it into himself, swallowing up death in and of himself. You see, when Jesus Christ dies on the cross, he takes the thing which should have had, in one sense, the last verdict. When he's raised from the dead, he breaks death's back. I love John Owen gives us that image of death's back being broken. He swallows it up into himself. And then when he comes back from the dead, he robs death of its power over us. He breaks it. And then because we have our own flesh in heaven, then he can resurrect us with them and then bring us with him into the presence of the father. And then he doesn't just do that in the future. He does it now by taking our very real dead hearts and making them alive. So what is the symbol of the new covenant? Is it a staff turning into a snake? No, no, it's our stone cold hearts becoming beating and alive again. It's us hating the things of God, now loving the things of God. You guys are here on a Super Bowl night because you love the word of God. Right? That's not a that's not like a trite thing. That is a that is a witness, right? And what's so what's the sign of our times? A transformed life in a reconciled community. When when we love one another well, Ephesians 3:30, God is demonstrating his wisdom to the world that he takes a bunch of people who have nothing else in common. No political affiliations, no no socioeconomic affiliations together. This, random company of people, and he calls them one people redeemer. That's how he's demonstrating his wisdom to the world, making people who were once far away near and by taking people who were once of Apollos, of so-and-so, of so-and-so, and making them now of Christ. So the story of Moses and Pharaoh not only reveals right, our own resistance in a way towards the things of God, but it also shows that the power of God can overwhelm those things, that Jesus Christ really does destroy death in his death. And uh, he has, in fact, overcome the world. Would you pray with me? Lord, as we think about your acts and as you have destroyed death, Lord, we pray that you would confirm that in us, that we would believe your word and that we would see death destroyed for our sake and that we would no longer live for the things which... Um, were of our past life, but that we would live for the things which are of your life in Christ. And we also pray for our church, Lord, that we would be a people of reconciled body, that we would be that living witness of your power, that John 13, 35, that they know us 
by our love for one another, these, this company, this band of people that have only you in common. We ask that in Christ's name. Amen.